first and foremost, what we see the most is questions around long-term fasting and its potential benefits on longevity. So not fasting to kind of count calories, anything of that nature, but more so how you think about quote unquote long-term fasting as it relates to longevity. You know, it's so funny when you and Josh and the team put this list in front of me the other day and I got through the first few and I was like, oh sweet, I don't have to talk about nutrition. And then I came to this big block of nutrition and I just wanted to start crying. I don't, did you guys deliberately bury this? Well, you don't want to have it too early so that your mood goes down right away. But we also know it's stuff people get asked. We get asked about a ton. People are very interested in nutrition. And, and I need to spend more time with my therapist understanding why I hate talking about nutrition. Because I do, I do think I have a lot to say on it. And I, and I, I actually think I'm knowledgeable on the subject. Um, and I know that, therefore, I should talk about it because I can add value in a sea of, um, you know, bad information. But, but the visceral response it produces in me, Nick, is uh, it's, very, it's, it's difficult for me to quantify, actually. So um, it, it, I've already forgotten your question. That's how much I'm just in the throes of pain at the moment. Long-term fasting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this fuzzy. Um, and to your priming earlier, I'm going to tell you this is an area where I've seen an enormous change in my point of view over the past 300 episodes. So by way of disclosure, um, some people listening to this podcast might know that, um, and, and there are many people I, I'm sure who are listening to this podcast who came into the orbit of, you know, our work through my, uh, you know, work in the fasting space. And so, so, you know, for me, fasting has historically been a very important part of my thinking about how to live longer, how to use fasting as a, as a Jiro protective tool. Again, I think a little bit of historical context is relevant here. We, we spoke earlier about rapamycin, which stands alone in the pantheon of molecules, the only molecule, the only molecule that has universally extended life across all model systems of eukaryotes, which span 1 billion years of evolution. That's a big deal. But we shouldn't forget that there is one intervention non-drug intervention that has also done that, and it did it long before, and that was fasting or caloric restriction, right? So, so there's clearly something magical going on with caloric restriction when it comes to elongating life. Um, but the question is, can we extend that into humans? And perhaps the more important question is, what would, what would the fasting protocol be? And I, and I wrote a, a piece on this a long time ago that maybe we should link to where I say, look, the question is how long should you fast? To what extent should you fast? And how frequently should you repeat the fast? Those are basically your three variables. And there are obviously so many combinations of those. I won't even say infinite because you could just draw a line in the sand and say, okay, you know, you should, you could, do a complete fast, you could do a 50% fast, a 75% fast, and just make it, you know, somewhat big and arbitrary. And you could do it for one day or three days or five days, and you could do it once a year or once a quarter or once a month. Like even if you took reasonable spots, it quickly becomes impossible to test all of these. Um, and so instead, what we're left with is a cult of personalities where people tell you what they do. And I've been guilty of that, although I hope I've always been clear at saying, I have no clue if this is quote unquote, right. Um, but what, what I was doing was doing seven to 10 days of water only fasting once a quarter, and then three days once a month on the alternative. So two months at, uh, you know, short fast one month at a long fast repeat. Um, now what data could I point to for that protocol? None, absolutely none. I made it up. I mean, I literally made that up and was, again, very transparently made that up. Um, were things happening in my body from a cellular level that were beneficial? Probably. Um, did I have great biomarkers to show that? No, because I was relying on very standard biomarkers. 
you know, um, and unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, my standard biomarkers are generally quite good. So it's not like, you know, yes, your glucose is going to go down, your ketones go up, your insulin goes down a little bit, but those things are transient. Um, you, you, you know, all of, and, and by the way, a lot of things got really bad when you fasted, right? Your thyroid function completely deteriorated. Uh, your uh, androgen function completely deteriorated. Um, so it wasn't like all good. But what was really interesting is, you know, the thing we couldn't measure, which was what was actually happening to those hallmarks of aging, right? Were we improving at the cellular level Things like senescence, autophagy, all of those things. Well, guess what? We can't measure those things, so we don't know. Um, we can try to extrapolate, and there was some rationale in my mind, I suppose, extrapolating from what we knew in mice, which is that, you know, this many hours of fasting in a mouse does indeed produce cellular changes that are incredibly beneficial to disease prevention. And therefore, given what we know about the relationship between mice fasting and human fasting, it should be that by about five days, I'm going to be experiencing some of those benefits. But then even if you knew that were true, then the question would be, well, how often do you need to do that? So even if you could establish that five days was a sufficient length of time to fast, should you do it five days a month, five days a quarter, five days a year? No idea. So you may ask the question, why did I stop my fasting protocol? And for me, it it really came down to two things, but I think the most important was that I just took a kind of look at the data, the bigger data of myself and realized over the course of three years, I had lost, I don't remember the exact number, but it was, it was getting close to 20 pounds of muscle. You know, it might've been 16 pounds of muscle over that period of time, because at, at least at the frequency that I was fasting, which I'm not saying was right or wrong, um, it's very difficult to gain back the lean muscle you keep losing, right? You, you lose a ton, you regain some of it. You lose a ton, you regain some of it. But I just couldn't dig out of that hole. Um, and so I think in around 2021, I said, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to just put the kibosh on fasting for now. Uh, and I'm going to make it, you know, uh, I'm going to make sure I gain back 20 pounds of muscle uh, that I have lost. And, and so that, that's, you know, that's my personal story with it. Unfortunately, I would still say, Nick, that, and again, I'm glad you separated this out and said, look, is fasting a viable tool for weight loss? Sure. It's one of the, it's one of the tools we have in the CRDR uh, TR kit. Uh, and by the way, in that regard, I still do it, by the way. So let, let me also establish, I, I am still a TR guy for the most part, right? So I'm, you know, I drink my coffee in the morning. I will, I will um, slug a protein shake in the morning that is very low in calories because it's just protein. So it's going to be 120 to 150 calories. Um, but I don't eat a meal until two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I have dinner at six or seven. Um, but again, I'm doing that for caloric restriction purposes. I'm doing that to manage total caloric intake, not because I think that there's some magical benefit that I'm getting um, by, you know, not having meals th th spread throughout the day. Um, to, I guess just to put a bow on this topic, um, why is this fuzzy? Well, I think it's fuzzy because we don't have the bio. It, it, in many ways, this suffers the same problem rapamycin suffers in terms of getting into much more dispositive clinical trials, which is we're clearly never going to do the experiment that asks people to undergo different fasting protocols for the entirety of their life to determine if indeed they live longer. So we're going to have to come up with better proxies, meaningful biomarkers of the hallmarks of aging. And if we can do that, then maybe we can start to get a sense of whether or not rapamycin and fasting should be important parts of our armamentarium as we, you know, think about ways to impact those hallmarks of aging. Two follow-up questions there. One of which is you mentioned there was kind of two things that caused you to change your mind. The first was the muscle loss and just that. What was the second? The second one is actually was just more of a social issue, which was at the time that I was fasting, I also happened to be traveling a lot, right? So I was, um, it was very easy for me to fast when I was away from home. So all of those fasts were done while I was in New York and, you know, I lived in San Diego. So 
I didn't have to be fasting around anybody. I was just fasting in my apartment alone. And even if I went out to dinner with friends, which was weird, but I did, you know, I would just sit there and drink, you know, soda water while they were eating dinner. Jocko famously tells a story about that one night. Um, but once I stopped traveling, uh, it meant, oh, well, all those fasts are going to have to be done at home. And honestly, like, I just didn't, I just didn't want to do it. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I don't want to, I don't want my kids to be wondering like, why is daddy never eating and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that, that became another reason independent of the biology. So the second follow-up would be, and you kind of hinted at it there, which was you would love to have biomarkers to know, you know, if it's working at what dose, how that works. But yeah, what would have to be true or what would have to change outside of that if there's anything that would cause you to start fasting again long term? I don't know. I would really need to see something incredibly compelling in a higher order model. Um maybe in a dog model or something like that. You know, again, like this is a great example of where that's such a, I, I think, I think companion dogs are such a great, um, model to study things that, that, it, you know, cause again, I think most people find binary fasting far easier than caloric restriction. And there's already a lot of controversy around caloric restriction. I have an entire chapter on this in Outlive where I talk about, um, the, the Wisconsin NIA mouse, uh, uh, sorry, um, the monkey studies. But, you know, for most people, like if I said, oh, you just got to reduce calories by 25% for, for the rest of your life and you're going to live longer. Most people would say, I don't want to live longer. That's torture. Um, it's actually easier to say, well, what if you just have to periodically do big fasts? And so I think we would, I would like to see an experiment of that done in a better model than just mice. <laughs> Thank you.